Now, that's quite a difference. You add all of that up and you accumulate it and you have a real problem. And so what we have, and this is verified by dozens of years of testing kids for kindergarten preparation, what we have is a kindergarten gap based on the differences of how poor kids are raised when compared with how middle class and affluent kids are raised. That's why we don't want to talk about it. That's why we don't want to be precise in defining the problem. And if we're not precise in defining the problem we're trying to solve, then we're likely not to be able to solve the problem that we need to solve. We'll, tr we'll chase off after all sorts of, of ideas and solutions that will have no bearing or very little bearing on trying to correct the underlying conditions which produce the achievement gap. That's what we've been doing for 40 years. And it started 40 years ago, just a short detour in, on history. We've known this so well because uh, 30, 43 years ago, there was issued something called the Coleman Report, which was a, a, the largest social science survey ever undertaken by the federal government, uh, named for James Smoot Coleman, who was the chairman of it done on a deadline that Congress had set because Congress and Lyndon Johnson at the time of the Civil Rights Revolution and the Great Society, they were interested in adding to Title I, which is the program that had been started in 65, which directed federal resources for the first time to school districts based on the number of poor kids they had. And the money was supposed to be used to prepare poor kids better for school and, and to get them through school more successfully. And what they had in mind was that they wanted to have a second program that would use federal funds to construct schools because they believed that it was the absence of libraries and laboratories and overcrowded classrooms that explained why poor kids didn't do as well. And in, at that time it was really expressed as black kids and white kids because so an overwhelming percentage of black kids at that time were poor and, and uh, an overwhelming percentage of kids who were middle class were white, so it was mainly a black-white thing. And Coleman interviewed and tested hundreds of thousands of kids, tens of thousands of teachers and parents in this largest survey, and he came back with results that have been challenged over and over again by the doctoral dissertations by thousands of scholars trying to disprove that this was the case. But here's what he found, or what his, what his report found. First, the largest explanation for the variation in academic achievement among kids is the social economic status of their families. The higher the social economic status, status the higher the achievement. Uh, second, the second biggest variation in achievement is explained by the social economic status of who you go to school with. So if you're a poor kid going to a school where 85% of your classmates are middle class, you're going to do better than a poor kid who goes to a school where all of your classmates are poor. The third and the only other statistically significant variation or explanation for variation in achievement was a very modest contribution made by the quality of teaching. And it was, it was sort of a generalized uh, force that became reduced to the quality of teaching. So this became, first of all, highly controversial because people misinterpreted it and said that schools don't count. They don't matter. Because what matters is who you pick to be your parents. If you pick the wrong parents, you're out of luck. If you pick the right parents, you'll do okay. That's the, well, that's not much. And schools don't matter. Well, that's, a, that's an incorrect a, a conclusion to draw from this, but that's where we went. This was accompanied a year before by the issuance of another report. Uh, and then I'll move on to the second problem. Daniel Patrick Moynihan was, uh, died not long ago, U.S. Senator from New York. Uh, he had been the ambassador to the United Nations. He had been the ambassador to India. He had been a scholar at Harvard University. He had produced 15, 20 books as a scholar. He uh, was uh, uh, a brilliant scholar and a brilliant uh, politician, and he, early in his career, was the Assistant Secretary of Labor for the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. And he 
was uh, perplexed and troubled by a statistic that he came across uh, in 1964. And he was so troubled that he actually authored a pamphlet, a short book, uh, not about as short as this, in plain sight. Uh, I've already lost one member of the audience. Come on, it hasn't been that long. Um, the, uh, he was troubled by a finding from statistics on the percentage of black children born to single mothers. He says, this is not a good thing. He says, the family is the principal organizing unit of our society. It's how we, it's the family that transmits our values. It's the family that gets kids prepared to be educated. And this is such a difficult job that you need to have both parents involved. You need to have two adults who are, who are nurturing and rearing a child. And if you don't, then you have a problem. And here was the number that had caught his attention. The percentage of black children born to unwed mothers had spiked to 25% in the year before he wrote The Negro Family in America, which was what he titled his uh, pamphlet. 25%. Now, the American, the average for the United States as a whole is well, ab is well above that now. And the last year that uh, statistics were collected by the Census Bureau, that number for, for black infants born in the United States was 72%. Um, and here's the, here's the problem. If you combine single parenthood, and, and by the way, I'm now an expert on this. I have to, I have to do this because uh, I'm an expert on this and in a way that is inarguable because I now have an eight-week-old grandson who lives only a couple of blocks away from me, uh, and I've got other grandchildren, but this is the first time that one has been spent his first eight weeks nearby, so I see him just about every day. And he's, he's born into a home with two college-educated parents uh, who have got some financial stability and... and uh, they are supported by a lot of friends and family. And on the day that they brought uh, little Shep McInnes back from the hospital, they were terrorized. This was their first child. They were on their own. What are we going to do? They were driving home from Mount Sinai in New York with this little thing. They had never driven home with a little thing like that before. Uh, it was just terrifying. I mean, they were pleased and joyous, but they were terrified. Now imagine that you are driving home or taking a cab home from the hospital with your first child, and you're 19 years old, not 30 as my daughter-in-law is. You've not finished college. In fact, you may not have finished high school. You don't have a job, and you don't have, you don't have the biological father in the home to help you, married or not. And you are going to a neighborhood where an awful lot of other kids are born to in, under those circumstances and where the, the support structure is very weak. And now you're supposed to raise this complex little bundle. There's, there are a few things in life that are more difficult. Even under the best of circumstances are there a few things in life more difficult than being a parent. 